thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to order. It's a little past four, so I think we should uh, go ahead and uh, call the roll. Certainly. Senator Hancock. Here. Senator Wyland. Senator Liu. Assemblymember Buchanan. Assemblymember Hagman. Assemblymember Nazarian. Esteban Almanza. Here. Kathleen Moore. Here. Cesar Diaz. Here. Irena Ortega. Here. We have a quorum. Um, quickly, I'll just start by saying I'm Irena Ortega. I'm the newly uh, appointed Chief Deputy Director at the Department of Finance, and I'm here representing uh, the Director, Ms. Mata Santos. Um, I want to just say quickly, we're going to take one item out of order. Senator Hancock has um, a, a time constraint, and she's asked that we take up item eight now, uh, which we will do, and then we'll head back to um, the next item as soon as we wrap that one up. So uh, item eight, the High Performance Incentive Grant. Good afternoon. Um, we wanted to just briefly give the board an overview of the High Performance Incentive Grant Program. Okay. And uh, uh, just wanted to, to explore options on how we can evaluate um, providing those grants uh, to other uh, participants in the program. And just a brief history that uh, Proposition 1D provided over $100 million um, for the High Performance Incentive Grant Program. <clears throat> Uh, again, it's just an add-on grant that was uh, based around the, some of the new construction and modernization projects. And the goal was to promote uh, the use of design materials, promote energy efficiency, water efficiency, maximize uh, the use of natural lighting, indoor air quality, uh, use recycled materials. Um, and the list is on very extensive. Uh, the program has been available to new construction and modernization, uh, the Career Tech Educational Program, the Overcrowded Relief Grant Program, the Critically Overcrowded School Grant Program, the Charter School Program, and the Facility Hardship Seismic Program, which is currently, um, the regulations were adopted by the board that are going through the Office of Administrative Law Review right now, currently. Um, there has been changes in 2010 that have actually increased the participants in the program, and that was actually to incorporate additional points um, and also incorporate a base grant into your projects. So the status of where we're at right now currently, out of the original $100 million, we still have $38.4 million available in this program. And so what really are, are options that we could potentially explore? Um, and we wanted to do an intake of the program projects that we have in-house. Uh, we intaked um, and reviewed uh, the recently filed overcrowded relief grant program. Uh, we actually have seven uh, projects that have a high performance incentive grant uh, associated with those requests as opposed to the 14 that was noted in the item. So that's nearly two point, excuse me, nearly three million dollars in request in that area. And so based on the higher density um, and the wards on the priority system, um, as such, we, we're not really clear if those grants will be awarded to those applicants because we're currently reviewing the high density area <clears throat> for those projects right now. And so we just wanted to give the board an update as potentially some of those projects that are in the pipeline. We also wanted to acknowledge um, there are projects that are sitting on the lack of authority bond list. Um, there's in two categories in the new construction and modernization. But those projects currently can access the program, um, but they have requests up to 81, excuse me, $8.1 million. Uh, and we do have the acknowledged list, meaning those are applicants that came in past November 1st, uh, in which we're no longer processing those applications. We have about $650,000 in requests associated with those projects. So how can we access the program or provide some opportunities? Um, what we have before us is two potential options that the board could explore, or one of them requires legislative action. Uh, that would be to provide the funds um, to another program, but that would require a two-thirds legislative vote. Um, that would actually provide the ability to uh, apply the funds um, with that approved initiative um, to other programs within the school facilities program. And again, that requires a legislative change. And another thing that we wanted to highlight is um, as effective uh, January 2011, Cal Green has been um, a program that has been mandated in the measures that, uh, as it applies to new projects that are being built. So they must comply to all the Cal Green code. Um, and that's how it exists right now in the current structure of Cal Green. Um, so that is really the option before, one of the options before the board. The other option is um, whether or not we have the ability to bifurcate the grant. Um, currently, um, as we process applications, it generally 
moves forward with another component of the project, meaning new construction or modernization or other program that has bond authority. The board has never really treated these bifurcated grants in, in any manner. So how do we deal with that? Um, and so at one way we can deal with that is you would have to um, process that via regulations. We would still have to potentially process the application provide the award to the HPI grant, a high performance incentive grant, <clears throat> place that project on the, on the unfunded list, and then you move the other portion of the project that we have no bond authority, and you place that on the, what we have no bond authority list. So they would have to be, we can't accept those applications currently, um, so you would have to figure out a way, a mechanism to place those on the list. Um, so, but the, so the issue associated with that is um, we would still have to process the application in its full capacity. Um, although that would be uh, conflict with the current regulations, uh, the current regulation that was adopted by the board was to no longer accept applications and process applications beyond the bond authority as it relates to new construction and modernization. So that's something that we would have to um, try to figure out whether or not there's a mechanism in place to deal with that. Um, another um, question that was explored at, at one point in time is whether or not the high performance incentive grant could be a standalone grant program. Um, I think that's something that we actually did uh, discuss with legal counsel. They believe that the Bond Act may have some restrictions associated with that, and it's not really constructed in a manner that we could actually place that as a solo pro program. So it has always been coupled with the new construction or modernization um, project. So there may be some conflicts there in the statute and in the bond provisions. Um, one of the other considerations is, uh, in accordance to the Ed Code, um, it does talk about the full and final provision and whether or not um, if we do, the board decides to go down that path of processing an application and placing it on the unfunded list and then allowing that project to have the ability to access the cash, um, does the full and final provision, does that, is that adopted in the project, meaning there is no, perhaps no ability for us to, to activate the project, the portion of the project that has no bond authority. So that's something that we would have to, um, try to work out as far as that statutory requirement. So I think the full and final provision is something that uh, we definitely need to explore. On page uh, 104, again, it's just the, the process and how we would uh, adopt the construct of uh, processing and, and high performance incentive grant that has no bond authority. That's laid out there. Um, again, we would have to figure out a mechanism to um, <coughs> process that grant um, and create uh, Park that the portion of the project has no bond authority, uh, either on a, a true unfunded list or a uh, acknowledged list. Um, so, another item that we did definitely want to share is um, out of the numerous projects that we process in the um, Proposition 1D program, there has been a 12% participation rate in the high performance incentive grant. So. It's, it's a voluntary program. It's not a mandate that districts have to participate. It has to be obviously an, an option that the district wants to pursue. Um, so we've had um, a marginal amount of participants in the program. Um, with that in mind, uh, again, some of the considerations is whether or not that the project, the portion of the project that has no bond authority, whether, that, whether or not that creates an obligation of the state. That's something that we would definitely have to explore. Um, may need to get some clarification on the full and final provision um, as it's constructed currently. Um, we also do have program bond authority in the charter school program, and we also have um, the ability to access the high performance incentive grant through other means in facility hardship, again, the seismic program. And we, I did send a note out to some of our, all of our members um, during the week that we have 120 plus million dollars in projects that are currently going through a review process for seismic mitigation, and some of those projects could have some components of high performance incentive grant. So I just wanted to provide you uh, a little bit of background about what our options are. Thank you. Are there any questions? Cool. So um, on the HPI grant program, what's the what's been the average grant award? It's been, on average, it's been about $285,000 per project that qualifies for high performance incentive grants. So with $35 million left, that would be what, 100, 100 plus, 140, 140 projects with a 12% participation rate. We're talking about 11, 1,200 projects. 
Potentially, yes. Yeah. And how many are in the pipeline? There's, um, as Ms. Silver mentioned, there's, there's two lists that we have. We have some that are on the unfunded list, which these are projects that don't have bond authority but have been approved by the board. There's about a uh, little over $7 million that are requested. And there's $650,000 that are requested on the projects that are on the acknowledged list. But the number of projects that are total number? Oh, um, 15. 50. Well, 15 that requested high performance incentive grants. 15. 15. 15. 15. 25, I'm sorry. Um, I, I think, you know, getting two-thirds of the legislature to approve putting it into one of the other programs sort of, um, while we know there's demand for more new construction and modernization, um, doesn't really use the money for the purpose it was intended. So I'm not sure that's the direction we want to go. So now we have a situation where we have some money. We'd like it to be used for high performance purposes, but um, our guidelines are for whatever per reason. Some of it probably is because the, the amount of money that we give out, the grants aren't really high enough, I don't think, to provide the kind of incentives that we really need uh, for schools and, and some districts are going through with it regardless. Um, so we want to have, I think we all hopefully share an objective that we want to get the money out to high performance projects. Now, um, I don't want to have to process new construction and modernization applications and spend all that money um, until we sort of have, have clear guidelines or whatever in terms of the, the next bond, um, because there is a cost to all of that. But I do, I think, share the senator's goal of getting this money out to being used. And given that we have Prop 39, dollars that schools are going to be receiving, this seems to me like an optimal time to be able to leverage those dollars. And so, you know, I don't know if there is a 2A option, because I would like to be able to actually allow districts to apply for the high performance amount without having to go through the full new construction or modernization. And I know we have two sort of conflicting opinions on this um, and that, that we may or may not need to get resolved. But when I read the full and final language, I think we sort of find ourselves in a situation where this language was written before the HPI program was, um, was uh, designed. And when I read it, it clearly, I think, was written at a time where it was designed to deal with new construction because it says, you know, full and final contribution to the project and for eligibility for state facilities funding represented by the number of unhoused pupils for which the school district is receiving the state grant. So you actually don't even have unhoused pupils in a modernization program. So we're sort of applying that to our different programs. And I think maybe it was written at a time where it was, we were really talking about new construction. So I don't know if we need another opinion, but I would, I would love to see a solution that's narrow enough that we can get the money out for high performance projects as standalone projects, uh, particularly leveraging the Prop 39 dollars. And, um, and if we do need an, an opinion, I, you know, I'm willing to, to move there, but I, I would like to see us move forward with some kind of regulations at least so we can begin to, um, I mean, we still would have to have time to approve them, but so we can begin to move forward in this, this area and actually get the money out. Ms. Moore, and then. Okay. Assembly Member Hagman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, when I looked at this too, I was, you know, I think we all desire the same thing. Let's see where this money's going. I'm very concerned, and we talked about this in depth, about making the unfunded list where it's obligation to new dollars we have coming in the future. And I don't want to go there. I, I, we just don't know what that new bond, if a new bond, what it's going to look like, same qualifications going. So if the if that side of it is not open for us to go there, I don't want to, besides this, you're qualifying that, that simple basic level, I don't want to go that far. I do think we're talking about a small amount of money, a small amount of money for each school compared to the 
millions that are going out each year over in the Prop 39 for the next five years. So it really makes a lot of logical sense to somehow tie that into supplementing or, or putting the filling the blanks of what Prop 39 may or may not qualify for through CEC when they finally get their nine-month version of getting the regulations out um, to get people to apply for the dollars. There's going to be some things that's not going to be probably they're going to look at and say that doesn't really qualify, but it really makes sense to do at the same time. I uh, put new insulation in, we're putting a new air conditioning unit in, or simple things like that. And since we have the potential of um, legislation coming out at the beginning of next year for this next session, um, what I asked when I got briefed was, you know, can we look at some of these applications coming in at the end of the year through CEC for Prop 39? I mean, Prop 39 we're spending 500 million, we're spending 38 million over the next couple of years versus 500 dollars, 500 million a year. It's really pennies compared to all of it, but it can be maybe something structural. It could be something that is not going to be covered by CEC well that can go very quickly together with that, not necessarily with. Um, and if we need to do something either legislatively or regulations, we'll know a little more information there as those as those applications start coming in by the end of the year. So in January or February when we're drawing up the potential language for a new bond and whatever things we need to do with these pots of money that's left over and try to put them in there, we have more information to do it that way. So you know, I guess I'm making a motion to kind of study it until we get through the end of this year and, and with that, get, trying to get some, back, some feedback from the staff on Prop 39 as well as anything else. I mean, the projections are if you put some away, you're going to have $20 million left over probably that's going to be out there. We just don't want to be sitting there for a couple of years while the bond goes out but or until we get new bond dollars in. But at the same time, you have, to, you have the obligation to process the request you have to the rest of the pots of money, so you still have to put some money away for that as well. Senator Hancock. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. I know this has been an ongoing saga, trying to figure out how to get this money out. And I think one of the problems was we didn't really know how to market it or talk about it in ways that would be intelligible to schools that are facing a myriad of challenges. Um, just even the little discussion we had here today, you see it becomes very technical and somewhat difficult. So I've been trying to think about how we can do a variation on option two. Um, the problem has been that the regulations that we set in place, not necessarily the bond language, has led to a legal counsel opinion that we can't do standalone grants because if we could, we could easily have this money spent. Um, it has to be attached to some other grant category. Um, and um, we could really do a number of things. We could change the regs so that it's a standalone category. Um, or we can do a variation on number two that we uh, that we change the regulations that would allow us to approve and fund the existing high performance incentive grants for which we no longer have authorization to fund the rest of the project. In other words, they are tied to some category that we have, but we don't have, um, it would be projects that are on the unfunded list, but they have been, a, they've been approved. Um, the motion would, would read this way, but I, and I'm very open if people want to change the regs and have standalone grants, because I think that would be simpler. But let me just try this motion, which is um, based on option two, which would be that we request the staff to bring back to the September board meeting regulatory language authorizing the board to approve and fund high performance incentive grants that are part of the new district modernization or construction applications and that are currently on the true unfunded list or the acknowledged list, which means we've looked at them. The regulatory changes would also provide that the high performance incentive portion can be funded without triggering a full and final designation, achieving in de facto a, a standalone. Um, thus providing for the main application to retain its standing. 
until um, until there's another bond. And um, I would also suggest including language that would direct the staff to recommend an increased bond amount because I think those issues are very well taken about the fact that it may have been too technical and too little for the hoops that we were asking people to jump through. Can I have that? Yes, council, please. Um, I would just like to state that um, the standalone, that the statute specifically states that the HBI grant has to go through the SFB, the Leroy F. Green Act. So for the Prop 1D ap appropriations, mm -hmm. The funds have to go through the Leroy F. Green Act, so it's it's, it's statutory. It was it wasn't an opinion. Um, the other thing is, if you do a regulation that allows for the HPI to be funded outside of allows for the acknowledged list, but then have the HPI to be funded, you will um, be able, you will hit the full and final statute. The full and final um, statute uh, is ki is kind of nuanced. The intent was for the funding by the state to be done on a one-time basis. So the issue would be if you fund the HPI, then the districts will only be receiving the HPI. The districts will have to certify that based on HPI and their local funds, they're going to be building the school. They then cannot come back uh, for the rest of their project uh, project funding. That is the problem um, that we have at this point. So I, in, in my opinion, we would want to get clarification from the Attorney General or maybe an opinion from the Attorney General as bond counsel um, to give us um, a determination on whether that is in fact, um, that is in fact a real issue. Yeah, Ms. Moore. So when you say that it has to go through the Leroy Green Act, can it go through the Leroy Green Act as a high-performance grant? The high-performance grant um, funding has to go through and be part of a project for new construction and modernization. So it is not separate from a project. It is an incentive to a project. Assemblyman Buchanan. Out of curiosity, then, if there were to be some legislation to address that, um, what's the vote? Is two thirds as well? That is what the statute requires. Yes, two thirds vote. Well, well, this is my issue. Um, if if you pick out, I mean, we we made a conscious decision that we were going to have a <clears throat> you know an acknowledged list where we weren't going to take up staff time and the money and the cost to process applications. So if we process, go through all that time and cost to process applications just to fund the HPI portion, then one, you're incurring the cost, but two, you potentially then are taking some projects and processing them in a higher order than others, and which is why if it's possible, whether it requires legislation or whether it requires an AG opinion, it seems to me that being able to fund high performance projects on a standalone basis, um, particularly when we can, can use that to tie in with Prop 39, is the direction we want to go. We clearly don't want to trigger the, the final language because, you know, no district would apply for it if they had to give up all of their modernization or, or new construction language. But, you know, and just processing the ones that are currently on the list, if you don't get into processing the applications or the others, you know, those will get funded in due time regardless because they would, they're, only, they're on the list because we have dollars. Doesn't help us exhaust the money that's there, even though it's not a huge amount. So I still would like to see if there's a way, you know, we can uh, develop regulations, if it's possible to fund on their own, we may need, and then maybe we need an AG opinion, I don't know, 
and we could certainly have regulations developed at the same time we're getting that opinion so that um, we can be ready to go and we can fund these projects um, and uh, and I if it requires legislative action then maybe that's something that we we have to consider but I just don't I, I think at this point in time if we're going to move forward we do are going to have to have some way to bifurcate whether we're funding that portion and then holding the other we've, we've got to have some way that we can we can legally do that you know that is what I was trying to do with this language that said that the regulatory language that would be drafted would say right. would not trigger the um, well I don't know if regulatory time. language can supersede mm -hmm. statute mm -hmm. yeah. so so that's the the problem and there seems to be some disagreement about that so we have to figure out if we want a legislative fix and we want to go in and um, do something with the two-thirds there I mean two-thirds you can have an urgency or if we want to get an AG opinion but if we're all, if we all agree we'd like to be able to get the money out on a standalone and and, get, and put it to use yes. then we're gonna to have to figure out how we do that in, in a way that's that's legal well, then let's let's look at it this way then um, first of all this has been a very small limited amount of money over billions and billions and billions of dollars for the projects that no one's applied for so frankly, how much need is there? And I asked that question when I was getting briefed too, and I know there's no application process, but when you're talking about $200,000 for a district for a school site versus the millions they're getting now with Prop 39, it's probably not going to be high on their priority list when they haven't applied the last seven or eight years for this money to begin with. But I think it's, it's pretty simple. I think we could go do it this way is, you know, take off a chunk that you think you need to satisfy every possible application between now and then the other pools of money goes off, whatever that staff determination is, there'll be a, a chunk left over, you know, maybe it's 20 million or whatever, and then if we want to try to sit there and tie that into Prop 39, that seemed overwhelmingly pretty much supported on both sides of the legislature to redraft that amount of it to try to tie into, throw it into the pile of 39 or to have it for uh, zero interest own grants or whatever you want to do. We had a lot of discussion on Prop 39, how to spend those dollars. Um, we could probably put that together fairly quickly and try to get that out without compromising anything that you're doing right now, without starting a new process, without going through new categories, without going through lengthy legal opinions. You still have enough money to finish up anything that's applied for, anything potential on the list, and still get the other 20, 20 million out or so. Okay. If I, I put forward a motion. Um, I didn't get a second to the motion. Does anybody else have a motion they want to make so that we could move this forward? I will do virtually anything. <laughs> I would really love to see maybe a working group of some of us because the staff seems to be flummoxed what? about how to how, how about I, I'll try a stab at it. How about this, Senator? Um, staff to come back with their best cap of what they will spend with the monies retained and the, the different pools of money we have paired on applications and what your knowledge is out there that people are looking for. Come up with the balance of those dollars and see if we um, come back with that amount. And then we propose to try to get a two-thirds urgency letter through the legislature to put that and compile it with the Prop 39 dollars. It's all kind of going to the same kind of goal um, into a separate, you know, transfer that by legislature into those funds either supporting it or a different category that supports it, whatever you think is the need on that. Can I try and simplify that? Yeah, please. Um, staff gave us what the projects are in the dollars. So is there a way that the M, com M committee or someone can come back to us with draft regulations that they're working on over the next couple of months and then subject to a legislative fix or whatever other information we need, then we can adopt those. But at least we're, we'd be ready at, at whatever time we think we all are, it's all legal, that we can go ahead and, and, um, and implement. I, I would say that I, I'm a little uncomfortable with having staff draft regulations at this point because I feel like there's a, a bit of information we still don't know. I'd rather hear a discussion about the Prop 39 coordination. I'd rather hear a little more about the legal questions, about the full and final, um, and what the ramifications of truly a bifurcation would mean. So I don't want to have staff kind of spinning their wheels on regulations with some direction here when I feel like there are some 
some bigger policy questions that still need to be answered before they could actually move forward with regulations. So, you know, I, I would not want to give such specific direction to say we're proposing regulations. Be so you're back. looking for either a legislative fix between now and the end of the session or an opinion that would... Um, I mean, there's 11 business days in yeah. the session. It's going to be difficult to get them in, even for you guys, in 11 days. But um, well, we have bipartisan support. <laughs> 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 but, but actually, it, an urgency measure. Yeah, I could go after, but we're out. We're taking off on the 12th. I mean, you could do it in January just as easily. But wouldn't it be great to let the staff work on this in the fall if we could put something out in a bipartisan way, simply to clarify? Because this isn't bad intentions on anybody's part. It's people stumbling around over their own regulations and trying to be a length of time everything seems to take. Well, my, my motion was pretty simple. Figure out how much you need to leave here, come back with the amount, and then we send it off for legislation in, in January to be used with Prop 39. And whatever that way, you we guys... We don't need an amount for it. We just need authority. The leftover authority to do it, oh. I guess. Well, why yeah. don't we put I, together... I like that. So that would be... Wait, let me try Sure. Because... That all of the 11 million odd that's been asked for now, we would fund out of this 38 million, and the rest of it we would essentially fold into Prop 39, um, or find you know, the, the, use how, it yeah, to how, enhance Prop it, they could come back with the suggestion where they use it for the administration because they're the ones doing the CEC stuff. But remember, there's a little portion of that that was applied for grant dollars already in, in Prop 39. wasn't very much the first year, but each year it builds up a little bit. I think it's $25 million. We could throw in that pot, and that way the regulation's already there. This is over and above what the schools get for allocation. They could just apply for that grant dollars and that Prop 39 part. So that's already been kind of sorted out. I agree with you entirely, but this is the problem, is that you don't want to fund these as standalones, even though they're already on the list for modernization or new construction, if we don't have assurances that either through the legislative fix or an AG opinion <clears throat> that it doesn't constitute full and final because it puts the district's funds at too much of a risk. These projects are going to get funded when the, when the, when they, you know, when the money's there for their apportionment, so they're in. And so we're, we're going to fund them. But if we move forward now and fund them on a, on a standalone basis and, there's that, and we don't have the legislative fix, then there, there's a risk there for the districts. Mm -hmm. And so that's why, you know, I believe we, we have to – what's clear to me is you're either going to get an opinion or you're going to get a legislative fix. Whether we can somehow get it done this year, if there's a vehicle, you know, um, I think we do that. If not, I think we, well, you never can tell. If not, I think you do it on an urgency basis when we come back. But that way it puts, it makes sure, that way we know we can fund all of them and it, it doesn't put um, any district at risk at a later date. So, so what I was going to say is also I like the idea of putting together a bipartisan group to work on this issue during the interim with the acknowledgement that there might be a two-thirds or a bipartisan solution that could come up with an urgency clause and then you can address this issue and then come back with a fix in January and get it through real quick, considering that you do have a lot of issues to go through. Well, it's pretty simple. Can you fund it as standalone? And then it doesn't count as more final. It's really but isn't there, It's writing itself right now. <laughs> so, I mean, we could ask for an AG opinion. Right. Frankly, so much of the opinion is how you ask the question. And we've just been through a lot of difficulties being able to agree on the language of a question, unfortunately, in the past. So it seems like rather than do that, which could spread out for another year or so, discussing the language of the question, we might want to craft what we think is good policy, as ha suggested. How about simply try to get a two-thirds? We already got a little subcommittee working on this stuff anyway. We're meeting a couple weeks. Well, we can meet before then. You're the chair of that. Let's get something back, put it out there, everybody, as quickly as we can to get approval for it. But we're all going the same direction. How do we get it from this pot of money over to where people can use it quicker? It sounds like we're all general agreement with the Prop 39. It's all kind of general, same field. Mm -hmm. And we'll figure it out as quickly as we can. But we're going to figure it out right here on the dais. Senator, if you walk through it, the rest of us come on as co-authors, and we 
I don't know if I have a vehicle or well, anybody else. We don't know. You're right. We'd have but to. You're, oh, you're talking about if we did it later. Right. Well, now we're later. We'd have to. Yeah, it would be great to do it now. And everybody wants to look in their portfolio <laughs> and see. If, um, you know, because, I, again, yes, I think there's some policy clarity. And the question is how to get there from here. And um, it might just be to take it into the policy arena is the way to do that. Um, so, yeah. so are you advocating uh, a working group and um, let, let the motion be quiet for now? Yeah, I, I think I am. Hmm. And um, if it's yeah. the understanding that the, the group would be interested in um, having some of us work together and checking in with all of you um, to see if there is something we can put together before the end of session or if there's something we could work on over the interim the and um, I got three of them Friday I don't know. well so I'll make a motion to the table this and figure this out and very quickly can <laughs> we, we no we want to be you know show that government can be efficient nimble and get the job done right <laughs> so we have some public and comments, not so. us who <laughs> Madam Chair members Tom Duffy for the coalition for adequate school housing uh, we're, we're in support of uh, the the idea that that uh, was proposed by assembly member Buchanan and also uh, by Senator Hancock uh, just one thought for you as you look at, at trying to weave this together. Uh, about eight years ago, you had an issue with the, the state uh, emergency portable program where, where districts were being encouraged to buy out existing portables. And uh, rather than fully loading a classroom and saying that you had to burn 20 or 25, uh, 27 uh, pupil units, you identified a very simple process where you said, we'll, we'll, we'll charge you a, a, a unit of, of uh, student eligibility. And that, therefore, got to the issue of this is a project, and, and we just subtract a unit of eligibility from new construction or, or whatever was done. I think it was new construction. So the suggestion here is that as you work on this, if, if there is this, this Im impediment of it needs to be a project, under this program and it needs to be attached. You may look at it rather simply, like you did at that time eight years ago, and identify that we can say apply and we will subtract a portion of, of a pupil unit. It then falls under this, this program. Clearly, uh, with Prop 39, uh, Member Buchanan, you're, we're looking at, at existing projects and modifying existing projects. So it may be that a, a district would have a portion of a unit pupil grant from modernization that could be identified. I simply offer that as this, if you have a, a legal conundrum here, a, a way of maybe threading that needle. Uh, that clearly you're trying to do something that would benefit us in schools. It would create jobs and it would burn down dollars that are real dollars. And so we, we think that this is a very positive discussion. If you solved the problem eight years ago and you did, maybe that same solution would be here uh, useful for you today. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Bill Orr, the Executive Director of the Collaborative for High Performance Schools. Uh, we've been a partner with the State Allocation Board, Office of Public School Construction, and the, and the uh, Division of the State Architect um, on the HPI program. It's the CHIPS criteria that forms the basis for the, uh, for the allocation of dollars under the HPI that was incorporated last into the regulations that were revised in January of 2011. Um, I'm very, I applaud the SAB for uh, the discussion that occurred today. It's been something that's been in the offing for about a year since uh, I first saw the first graph of when the general construction funds were going to be exhausted. I, and I, um, on behalf of CHIPS, uh, would support the options to uh, basically develop uh, either a regulatory or a statutory fix uh, that would continue using the money for the purpose intended, which are high-performance schools. Uh, it's quite an amazing situation because 
when Prop 1D was first passed, everyone was really focused on getting in line and getting, uh, getting the money for the construction funding. I think the HPI dollars play a really important role in bridging the resources that school districts need to build healthy, high-performance schools in this transition time between, uh, between state bonds. And so I really applaud uh, the discussion that's going, been going on here today and would be um, very happy to be part of that discussion, uh, whether it's a, a Prop 39 combination or a regulatory option. But I think this is a very positive direction and CHIPS fully supports that. Thank you. Madam Chair, may I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Since you're very familiar with the HPI grants and what they're used for, mm -hmm. and I assume you're fairly knowledgeable what the Prop 39 dollars are coming for, if I put like circles that, you know, fit over overlay, mm -hmm. is there anything that HPI will cover that Prop 39 won't? There's a lot of things that HPI would cover. In, in some respects, it would be with the amount of money, it's the tail wagging the dog in the relative dollars. The Prop 39 really focuses on energy efficiency, does talk about non-energy benefits. Um, the HPI funds are really focused on building healthier, high-performance learning environments. So it would include energy efficiency, but it would also include indoor air quality and thermal comfort and acoustics and other um, products that are incorporated into the school. So it's much broader but is very complementary to well, the Prop 30. Madam Chair, what I'm thinking is we're going to have a lot of dollars being spent, local schools, districts, over the next five years on this. And I'm talking to my superintendents, and it's very kind of prospective what the CEC wants from Prop 39, which makes sense. That's what the money's for. If there's any way we can detach this, and that's such a simple process. You submit your plan, you get approved, you go build it. Unlike waiting on these lists, waiting for matching bond dollars and all this stuff we're having, troubles getting those dollars out, we really do need to, you know, fund what we can to move it over there, but maybe have, take that secondary list that's not covered by Prop 39, define it a little better, and say these are company add-on grants that Prop 39 versus bond dollars. And then as people want to apply for that, they want acoustics, but you already got the place torn up, but all new wires and air conditioning, you can add this other portion it versus standalone grants where you got to bring the construction crews out again, you got to reschedule everything, you got to have the classroom shut down as well. So I think that's the, the direction to go is try to figure out where those circles don't meet, be it prescriptive for that, and just add it on where you can to the Prop 39 projects, let the schools know it's out there. And I think if you keep it that simple, you don't have an application process, you don't have you know, much more than we're doing already for Prop 39. You have some barriers and legitimacy. Keep our staff involved to make sure those things are being met. Keep it real fluid and simple, and it'll be gone. And before you know it, before the administration actually get the Prop 39 regulations out. Thank you. <laughs> well, then, Madam Chair, then uh, you know I would support having that working group and perhaps Assemblymember Hagman and um, Senator. Um, Hancock and maybe uh, Mr. Diaz and, and some folks that are interested in, in working on this project and clarifying it and trying to uh, massage it and come back to us either in 11 days or... Uh, or <laughs> well, if the Senator and I can agree upon it, then it means everyone's going to agree upon it, so we should be good. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, you know, to come back and, and uh, make the recommendations for the full board and, and uh, work yeah. out some of these... Madam Chair, I'll, I'll make a motion table, and I'll get in contact with the Senator's office the next day or two so we can't set up something very quickly and Great. do everything we have to do to get it noticed. Great. Okay. okay. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Anything else on this item? No. Okay. Let's uh, go back to item number two, which was uh, the minutes from the previous meetings. Minutes are ready for your approval, and we actually have the minutes from our June meeting and our July meeting. Move for sure. Okay. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, let's see. Tab number three is the executive officer statement. Ms. Silverman? Yes. Yeah, so we have three items to share with you tonight, and uh, those items relate to our latest uh, fund releases uh, that we have as a result of the priority and funding. We actually had two active rounds, uh, one in May which actually provided nearly $520 million in state grants. Um, the timeline for those 90 days actually did exhaust last Tuesday. Um, we did have a significant drawdown um, for those uh, folks that came in. Um, there are some projects that did 
make the timelines, but we wanted, before we report out to the board um, in that short window, we want to make sure that uh, we come through all our mail before we prematurely uh, make an announcement about uh, folks not meeting the requirements or coming within the timeline. So uh, we'll be reporting um, updates next month as far as uh, the projects that didn't make the 90-day timeline. Uh, the July uh, apportionments that we provided nearly $42 million. Uh, again, remind those folks that did receive uh, those project funds, the ability to receive project funds should have until October 8th to come in. Um, again, please uh, submit the requirements uh, with the right uh, fund request and the uh, documents that needed to access the funds. An update in the overcrowded relief grant program, uh, our 12th funding cycle just wrapped up July 31st. Um, we actually had $39.2 million in project bond authority and we received numerous applications, which is great, uh, that far exceed the existing bond authority. So we have 14 applicants for $88 million. So the program is now, could be oversubscribed. And so um, we do actually have uh, several applicants that actually did have uh, a high performance incentive grant as we shared earlier. Um, but we'll be evaluating those projects based on the highest pupil density and that is a trigger in how we award um, those project funding. So staff will be um, reviewing those projects and be introducing those uh, unfunded approvals um, very quickly to uh, a board soon. Um, so one other item that we probably need to, we definitely will be uh, addressing in the future is how do we deal with those excess applicants? Um, so staff will be bringing um, those items back to the board. The last item I wanted to share is the program review subcommittee update. Uh, we just had a meeting a few weeks ago, uh, discussed um, a number of topics, uh, dwelling unit augmentation, uh, supplemental grants, funding, uh, and funding for portables. Um, a lot of great dialogue and a lot of great input from the field, so that was uh, definitely uh, uh, a welcome to get some feedback. Um, we actually will be having a meeting next week and a series of other meetings that we're introducing as well. Um, so two meetings in October, we will have two meetings in November and a meeting in January with some goals uh, to introduce an item with a wrap up um, to this allocation board sometime in January. That's all I have to report. Thank you. Any questions from the members? Any comments? No. Uh, tab four is the next item. This is the consent agenda. Um, let's see, Ms. Silverman? Anything consent agenda you? is ready for your approval. Okay. Uh, thank you. I, I understand that um, there are two projects from Lake Elsinore that are ready to move forward now based on some previous actions of the board and regulation changes. That's correct. Okay. I wanted to note, too, that um, I'll be voting on the consent um, calendar, but abstaining from the Elk Grove Unified item. Thank you. Right. I just wanted to make some comments about the uh, Lake Elsinore projects. Um, obviously, there has been a lot of staff time dedicated to looking into these projects and making sure that they complied with the labor compliance provisions uh, in statute. Um, and so the sort of message is that a lot of the time that is being spent to investigate these, not only with the DIR, but also with OPSC staff, it takes away from the very important work that staff is conducting. So I would encourage a lot of the school districts out there to really take into consideration what's happening with these regulations, to follow them, and to do their best in complying with labor compliance provisions. Obviously, there's a small window. There's not that many more that, that are hopefully will not come through with this problem, but it also takes up a lot of our time in dealing with those as well. So uh, I would just encourage the school districts to pay attention to those regulations and abide by them because it, there will be a time that funding will not be available and a lot of the uh, flexibility that has been provided, I think, uh, will be exhausted. So I just want to say that. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Any other comments? Anything <clears throat> from the public? No, thank you. We have a motion and a second. So all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? We have the one abstention. Thank you. Uh, let's see. The next item is uh, tab number five. This is the status of fund releases. Yeah. Ms. Silverman? We'll get to uh, cut to the chase. On page 66 on uh, tab five, we've just been providing the board uh, regular updates as far as how much cash we've been dispersing in the program um, and been sharing that as a result of the, uh, the enactment of those uh, provisions. Um, so in June, we actually did disperse $242 million. Um, we didn't provide any updates to the board in July because we had a very brief meeting, and so um, we wanted to share that uh, with the board. And we actually dispensed of uh, $203.5 million in July. So 
we've been very active in um, providing cash awards to these uh, projects that we have activated in the 90-day process. Um, over the last several weeks, um, I know we had that deadline pending uh, upon us for some projects in May. Uh, we dispersed nearly another $80 million. So pretty close to $500 million have been dispersed in the last several weeks. So that's great news for those projects and, uh, and those awards. Okay, thank you. Um, Any questions? Anything from the public on that one? Okay, that's not an action item. So uh, item six is the status of funds. Again, yeah. Silverman? On page six, excuse me, tab six, page 70, um, a lot of the activity we, we are reporting in the status of funds uh, just relates to um, some projects that have rescissions in Proposition 1D, which is your upper category. Um, we actually um, have shown a column there that reflects the projects that have been awarded as a result of uh, converting this project from an unfunded approval to an approval status. Um, and that is reflective in the middle category for uh, Proposition 55. We did activate the two Lake Elsinore projects under new construction, so you show a positive amount there. And then the critically overcrowded school project for Elk Grove, that's $12.6 million. Um, we've had some uh, minor adjustments as a result of uh, some closeout items, which is uh, providing some additional opportunities for school districts to get reimbursed. And also in the Proposition 47 category, uh, a minor adjustment as well. So. Altogether, um, what's really reflective is uh, we have some closeout adjustments and some rescissions, and we're activating some projects. <coughs> Any questions? Any comments? No? Uh, let's see. The next item is a, an action item. It's uh, under tab 7, and this is the Kalinga Huron Joint Unified Fresno project. This is uh, an appeal. Thank you, Madam Chair. The district has a project that qualifies under the seismic mitigation program at the Kalinga High School. Uh, however, based on the regulations, this project qualifies for replacement funding of the building. The district has designed the project and uh, to rehabilitate and does not wish to replace the building. The district is requesting to receive replacement funding but be allowed the flexibility to rehabilitate instead. The district is also requesting high performance incentive grants for uh, under seismic mitigation. The board recently approved the regulations but they have not been approved by the Office of Administrative Law yet. So they're requesting that they receive the grants in advance of OAL approval. There's a couple of reasons why the district is pursuing rehabilitation versus replacement. Uh, one of them is that this is a poured in place concrete building which has a longer lifespan than other construction types but it also increases the cost to retrofit and replace. Uh, according to the district the amount of money that it would take to replace this type of construction would exceed the amount that the state would provide for replacement. Another reason is that the, due to the time that it would take to redesign um, the project, especially since they received Division of State Architect approval already. The district did receive um, federal qualified school construction bonds um, in the amount of $6 million that they have to use before April 2014. They also received an additional $2.65 million that they have to use before July 2015. So again, the amount of time that it would take to redesign the project, submit them through the agency, get approved, um, could the district could run the risk of not being able to use the funds before the required timelines. Uh, and lastly, the district has stated that this is a the building is a local, uh, it's a popular local fixture. Uh, it serves as a visual and emotional hub for the community. It's been with the district since the 1930s, so they would not want it to replace. Staff did disallow funding for rehabilitation based on the fact that, again, according to the regulations, they qualified for replacement. However, the statute governing the seismic mitigation program may allow the board additional flexibility as it only states that the district shall be eligible for replacement funding, but it doesn't say that the district has to construct the new facility. Uh, in this particular case, on page 86, we have the difference in cost in terms of how much it would cost to uh, rehabilitate the building which is $2.1 million versus the replacement amount, which would be $3.7 million. And then lastly, as far as the uh, high performance incentive grants, um, again, the regulations are going through the regulatory process. They're not in effect yet. The legal counsel has advised that we do not have the authority to approve the grants until the Office of Administrative Law approves them and the regulations become effective. Uh, with that in mind, we have a couple of options for the board to consider. Option one is basically to allow the district uh, to receive rehabilitation funding that's either with or without the high performance incentive grants. Option 1A is with the high performance incentive grants, 1B is without. 
And then option two is to uh, approve the funding under replacement, but allow the district the flexibility to either rehabilitate or replace. And again, option two comes with either uh, HPI grants uh, with or without. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions? I have a clarifying one. So if you're saying that we approve the option that allows for the HPI grants, does that delay the district's project until such time as the legal, until such time as OAL approves that, or are we, are, could we do two different fund releases, one now and one later when it's um, approved by OAL? The request by the district is that they get approved for the HPI grants now in advance of uh, OAL approving the regulations. Again, that is a, a whether the board has the authority to do that or not, that's a, a legal question and legal. Health counselors advise that we do not have that flexibility. Why is it an option? Yeah. It's what the district uh, had requested. Um, and again, we stated the legal concerns, but it's part of their request. Given the discussion that we had recently on HPI, is there a way to provide um, both the district with the, one of the options now for the rehabilitation or, or replacement? I, um, we can talk about that piece of it, but just the HPI piece. Could we, in, in essence, indicate, yes, we intend to fund them for that component when it is approved by OAL and not uh, and take that up or provide that funding at that time. Uh, you're saying it, it will be a conditional approval? Correct. Okay. Um, I haven't looked into that issue, but there may be a full and final issue with that. But certainly... Um, <laughs> Can you designate that it won't be full and final until such time as the second um, fund release goes to the district for the HPI grant? You certainly, that, that is within your discretion, but then we're budding with a statute, which is very nuanced, and that's why we have, uh, in my opinion, we should request um, AG opinion on that. It, it seems to me that... I, I believe we should fund the rehabilitation if that's what the district wants, but I don't think we should provide money in excess of the rehabilitation cost, in essence sort of letting them jump in modernization in other areas. So I think if that's what the district wants, we should fund rehabilitation. I don't know why we can't um, approve, though, the HBI subject, in, with, subject to the fund, funds not being released until the regulations are adopted. Um, they're That's not, what I meant they're, to they're, say. They're, right. <laughs> that, that they're not going to do the HPI project after the modernization. That makes no sense whatsoever. So all we're asking, all, we're, all they know is that, that we are approving it, but that the funds will not be released until the regulations um, have been adopted, in which case it gives them some level of certainty, but it, it doesn't release funds until we have regulations. Right. Here's my thing. They're at the top of the list for that money, though, right? And That's correct. They, and they're well, beyond our authority to grant them that, right? This is under seismic mitigation. Oh, the seismic we have only. bond authority for the, them? No, the seismic we're good on. It's the extra on top of the dollars. No, we're good on both. Yeah. We, have we have money have in seismic. We have money in HPI. That's correct. We just can't release the HPI because the regulations aren't final. But isn't there a question about not just the release of funds, but the application came in under the existing regulations? So I think there... Yeah. You know, I think there's a real question about whether you can authorize funds under the parameters of a regulation that was not in effect when they submitted their application. So that we that. But they were funded in the old regulation. Now, new regulation goes, so it starts the clock all over again for everybody. For, basically, in this if you don't do that, then everybody on our list will automatically so, get transferred so over. For stuff so what HPI regulation is this? In this right now? the the board recently approved regulations to allow seismic projects to also access high performance okay. center grants. Mm -hmm. That is the regulation that we're talking about. That's going through the Office of Administrative Law. Now, in the past uh, and historically, staff has uh, allowed districts to only request grants that are effective at the time of submittal. So in this particular case, the alternative would be for the district to withdraw the application and resubmit them once regulations become effective. That's been the past practice. I would say this is a very unique circumstance, and given that we have had difficulty um, 
uh, getting our HPI funding out, this is a perfect opportunity to provide for that and that we ought to look for the way best to be able to accomplish that and not require both the district and staff to have to reevaluate, you know, resubmit and reevaluate. I think that's uh, on a practical basis and not a real um, practical solution to this problem. Oh, it's yes. It's three here. Uh, yeah. I believe that you should be able to grandfather into the regulation certain uh, projects. So, when, when the regulation is can you can you clarify how far back you can do that? Um, that, yeah. <laughs> that is really within your discretion, but but, okay. but certainly you should be able to grandfather. But that is within your discretion. Well, and and while you guys are looking at it, it's three hundred ten three hundred ten thousand. We're thinking about or difference. Um, am I correct? correct? Okay, but they also ask you know the difference between the placement class and the Rehabilitation costs, I can't see you doing that either. But it was surprising to me to figure out that, okay, we're willing to pay you to get a new building at this level, or by statute, we can only fix your building this much to rehabilitate it. But when we rehabilitate it, it doesn't get to the same standard of a newly built building. And I would hope that maybe somewhere down the future, put it on the parking lot list, is that if you do do seismic retrofit, I'd rather do one project and get it to where it should be using seismic funds because we don't have the other funds left over, but get it to where it should be. Why do a project halfway and have the crews, again, economy of scale, have the crews in there two or three times when you can do the job of once and have it, you know, have them qualify up to a level that we want the school, you know, the basic level we want that building to be at um, after you get HBI or maybe not HBI because that's an optional thing, but at least up to the level that you build a new building to. Um, which is not for script this code. So they want to do all the extra stuff while you have the walls taken out and you're shoring up all these walls. You can't do the extra stuff with this seismic money, which seems kind of different to me. And since we're having a hard time with that pool of money getting it out too, I would think that's something we can lean on a little heavier to maybe allow some more of the things you should do on a newly refurbished building to have all the right bells and whistles in it to make it a good classroom or a good building. But I know we can't do that right now. I'm just asking maybe we start, put that on Ms. Buchanan's list of things to look at. <laughs> every, every lengthy list. Big list. from Southern California for the meeting. Yeah. <laughs> Madam Chair. Yes. There's also one alternative is maybe you can approve, but it will be on a very narrow basis. But that's, you know, that's an alternative. It shouldn't be precedent setting. Yeah. That's and that, that's that's why I don't want to do. I'm, I'm personally okay with the HBI added on top of it after the lengthy discussion. So I'll make the motion for. I'm sorry. What was that? With one uh, A. With the limited agreement that we don't do anybody else because it is that trans that area in there. I'll second the motion to keep it on the table, and then you may want to hear from the district. Is there any public comment on this item? The district is. The district is. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm with the uh, district, Jim Ricas. Uh, we we do plan. We have local money, and uh, so so we do plan on doing the full project, even though a portion of it was a modernization project. So the HPI grant, if if we can get the seismic grant, grant you know the uh, rehabilitation or the replacement, we'd be able to do the full project, and then our hope would be to get reimbursed for the modernization portion, but. We do plan on, on bringing the building up to uh, modern standards. I, I would just be hopeful, sir, that um, seismic would cover part of that because you got to tear it all open and you would think you'd place it all back. So I, don't, I see the illogic and the bureauc you know, bureaucracy we have here sometimes, and um, I was surprised at that too. Is that, did you have a comment? Just, um, one clarification on, on the motion. Uh, so you're saying 1A, which is granting them the HPI, which is still sort of in question whether we could do that or not, or is it basically 1B, 
with the contingency that they may get the HPI funding in the future, right? Well, I think um, let's break it down two portions. One, rehabilitation versus the replacement costs. I make the motion for rehabilitation costs because I think that's all we qualify for, the 2.164. And then, um, again, I'm trying to think of the long-term thing. I think the only reason why they applied under one system and their reg's not there to give you at the same time, obviously it's the intent of this board is to move that forward to have them both join together, but we're stuck with the timing of our council getting all the regs out at this point. And I think there should be a limited case. You may, you may else on the list here, so just be this one applicant at this time. Um, I would limit it to this one applicant and go ahead and grant the HBI the 306, roughly, thousand. Okay, so let me just uh, process the question here. So we have a motion regarding the rehabilitation versus the replacement on, on the table. Is there a second on that motion? We wait. Did you withdraw your motion? Because we have a motion for both right now. Yeah. Just back to make it easier. <laughs> so okay, so you withdraw off. your initial motion and you make a motion on. The I, I'm proposing the same way, Madam Chair. Whichever you want to take both together, one motion or doing two separate ones. I'm okay with that too. Okay, I, I would say I'll, I will say that I would prefer to have it in two separate items because I think we we remain concerned about this precedent and the issue of having an application come in under regulations that are not in place yet. So I, I would prefer to see two separate would, motions. Would you be any more comfortable if we didn't, if we if we approved the HPI portion, but um, funded when the regulations became effective, so that we're not um, we're not actually releasing funds until the rec regulations are effective? Yeah, I I think the issue remains not about the release of funds, but when the application came in, and I think that it right. is such a difficult issue on this particular one it, it's compelling but when you talk about all the kinds of applications that could come in and the different types of regulations that apply we have to hold folks to the standard of the regulation that exists at the time and i think if the if it is that much of a priority then they are able to withdraw and reapply for both parts of the grant under the different programs so i think just the the issue of when they applied and the regulations that existed at that time remains a significant concern i i understand your concern i when i'm looking at a three hundred six thousand dollar grant though you start to get into districts time and the cost of that time and staff's time and the cost of that time um, and and you clearly I think is, is time, yeah, yeah and you clearly I think do have intent on the part of this board to allow um, the seismic projects to be eligible or or we wouldn't be directing staff to draw up regulations and we know we're trying to actually find a way to spend mm -hmm. the dollars so I, I I respect where you're coming from but I, I think you know from a practical point of view um, uh, it, it it may make sense. I mean, if we want to put a condition on that, we don't set a precedent of actually releasing funds till we have regulations, but at least not trying to have people jump through too many more hoops um, makes sense to me. And I'm just saying the legal counsel, you said you could figure that out. What we're trying to do, you're okay with that? Because <laughs> the other ones usually say no. <laughs> Seismic has um, authority, bond authority, HPI has bond authority, both have bond authority. But in this case, really, you don't want it presidential. Mm -hmm. um, you want it very narrow if you do decide um, to go ahead with it. How do you, rec what, do you mm. what, what do you recommend then to help us narrow it to increase your comfort level? Is there? Can we just say that it is narrowly focused to this particular mm. circumstance um, that is before the board? To this particular, right? That this that particular should, application. application. Correct. Does it matter to you at all whether we release funds now or after? The regulations I would. Go I would prefer action? that we release after the regulations pass. And when are we anticipating that? January. January they would still have to compete in the 90-day process, and right now they don't have an unfunded approval until the board authorizes the unfunded approval, and then they have a certification window sometime in November that opens up that would allow them to participate in the 90-day process. So right now, even though uh, the regulations come in effect, um, they would still have to wait for that approval process. So if they're more comfortable with that, and the chances are the regulations are going to be in effect by the time we fund anyway, then what we're really doing is saying we're not going to make you send in a second application. Is that a motion? 
I still had mine. Yeah, with the add on that, it was. I've been making motions all day, not getting anywhere. So I don't know. I don't know if I want to try anymore. I I move that we approve it was one the, B. the rehabilitation with um, HPI and the HPI funding portion. Uh, um, the HPI funds not be released until the the regulations are approved. And that this is a narrow and that this, this applies is a to this specific uh, yeah. uh, project. I'll second. Senator Liu? Aye. Assemblymember Buchanan? Aye. Assemblymember Hagman? Aye. Assemblymember Nazarian? Yes. Esteban Almanza? No. Kathleen Moore? Aye. Cesar Diaz? No. Irena Ortega? No. Okay, motion does not carry. I'll, I'll do it. Can we then? Is no. Let's do, let's go ahead and split it up in two. And we'll hold the roll open, and if Lonnie comes back, then she could add on whatever. But let's put the two parts together. So move one A, as is to fund the rehabilitation. Second. Hey, I got one. Second. It's like on the floor all over again for me. <laughs> <laughs> so you you said one A, but you mean. The, one B. Just the issue of the, the w option one A is just the. So you want to close the roll on the other and take two motions. Yeah, yeah. correct. Yeah, so it's not it's not option one A because that's the yeah. that's the previous action. It's to um, just approve the rehabilitation. Oh, it is. I'm sorry. One yeah. B. Correct. Sure. I'm sorry. I just You're right. To clarify that. So it's one B. Thank you. Motion and a second. Call the roll. Senator Liu. Aye. Assemblymember Buchanan. Aye. Assemblymember Hagman. Aye. Assemblymember Nazarian. Esteban Almanza? Yes. Kathleen Moore? Aye. Cesar Diaz? Aye. Arena Ortega? Aye. That motion carries. Okay, and then we'll make the motion to fund the HBI center grants after the regulation has been processed. Um, so we'll one application of approval here. Seconds. Okay. Senator Liu? Assemblymember Buchanan. Aye. Assemblymember Hagman. Yep. Assemblymember Nazarian. Yes. Esteban Almanza. No. Kathleen Moore. Aye. Cesar Diaz. No. Arena Ortega. No. And that motion does not carry. Open um, on that motion. Any, anything else on item seven? Okay, moving to item. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Moving to item nine. Madam the, Chair, yes. if before we go, um, I know that we have gone over the um, action item already, but if um, uh, with the pleasure of the board, I would like to also be involved in the, um, the subcommittee work on the um, HPI regulation. The department is working closely with the CEC on Proposition 39, and so I think we could provide that bridge um, for that component of it if the board is agreeable. Okay. The only caveat is if I'm working on legislation, I could talk to my other members about having announced three days in advance meetings. As soon as I bring you in, I have to announce it and have it three days in advance. So maybe we can work on it a little bit ahead of time first and then bring it back and well, show it to everybody. Why is that? The Brown Act versus not Brown Act. It's strictly We're legislative not stuff. We're not subject to the Brown Act here, are we? Bagley yeah. Bagley Bagley Bagley, whatever. And so uh, I thought Cesar was on it already. So he is on it, yeah. Oh. Well, well, well so. Lou just said Lonnie and I should get together and work on the legislation. Right. And. Or we go back to the original committee, but whether it's just if you want to get done in 11 days, it's going to be difficult to do. Then, then if you, why don't, I'll, I'll withdraw that if you have a solution that, you, that will come forward in 11 days, of course. Um, and and then if not, well, if you Well, Republicans get this done is very rare, but if, we, if the majority party wants to try to do it, we could talk to it. Absolutely. We, we could okay. two, two tracks, two tracks. All right. I withdraw that then. Thank you. Item number nine, the quarterly school facility joint use program release status we'll report. We'll make this really quick. So uh, an update that the, the board did provide a, uh, some grants to some 
districts in the joint use program. There was a 5.1 originally allocated. Uh, we reported there were four originally um, have provided this update. Um, three have accessed the cash. One is still working on that process. Although they have made some significant improvements, uh, they actually have a approval with the Department of Education and Division State Architect. Um, so they have approved plans in place for their project. And they submitted that to our office on June 19th, and that is a requirement um, in the program. But they have 18 months to convert that project now that those plans have been approved. So they actually have until December 19th to actually access the cash. So that's an update. Um, I don't know if we have any questions. Any questions? Any comments? Uh, item number 10, the three-month workload. I'm not sure if we have any comments on the workload report we have before you. Any Comments or questions? I, I have a so I have a question. So for for September, are you saying we will be bringing forth the four Oakland, Los Angeles, Glen, Lagunitas? Is that is that part of this discussion right now? I'm sorry. There's uh, several projects that we've been working very closely uh, with, and some of these projects may result in some solutions that could be resulting administratively. Okay. So the goal is to continue working on those particular projects and so we may have a very um, limited amount of documents and update in your appeals section so as it stands now they're still open but we will likely have some <coughs> items resolved um, really soon okay so but if it unless they're resolved administratively those would be the ones coming forward next month that's correct is that is that's that correct. moreover and okay Anything else? And then let's see, item number 11 is uh, information items. Any it's basically the, the next board dates um, we have okay. penciled out. Um, the only date we have to work out is uh, the December date. So, okay. Is there a determination yet on that? or? or? Well, um, it's all hopeful um, whether or not there, there is a fall bond sale for this program. And we will try to, um, if there are outcomes that there are bond sales that we have the ability to provide apportionments and convert those projects in December. So timing is something that we're working on um, with the treasurer's office if there is a sale to be announced. So we'll be, we'll be keeping the board updated on those uh, particular activities if there is a sale for this program. If there is not a sale, do you anticipate that there would not be a December meeting then? Is that, is that kind of what we're waiting for? It, it is all conditioned on the chair and vice chair and the type of workload we have to present. Okay. Can I just ask a question? I, I'm sorry to be taking up all this, but just for scheduling, because a lot of people depend upon the schedule to, to make their plans. And we had a process that we're doing p potentially every other month. Is there the anticipation that that process will continue and that we do think we'll make the decisions each month that whether we're going to have the meeting that month um, for the rest of the year? But I think we're in the same place where we just don't have enough workload to just by having long meetings every month. Okay. Thank you. You know, we'd be here if our little computer heads, you know, FaceTime where we're at. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? That's it. Anything from the members? Is there anything? Um, are we holding the roll open for something? Yes. So we yes. can we can keep the the meeting open for a few minutes to see if Senator Hancock is going right. to join in on any okay. of the items, um, and then. Oh. Thank you. So would they have to send a whole new application, or the, could they amend their existing application at the time the HPI regulations are become effective? No, it would be the same application. 
uh, unless there's additional information documents that they would want to for us to review but so it's the same application yes so when we say they submit a new one um, they'd have to correct okay that's what this one that's why that's and most my question yeah yeah okay so We're done. I think we're waiting for, um, they can leave the roll open for the senator. So she comes. Yeah. Onward, huh? Yep. Onward. It's getting complicated. I'm going to go ahead and call the roll on the open items. Thank you. Okay, Senator Hancock. <laughs> what is the motion? I'm sorry, everybody. Uh, I was just going to. I was just going to tell you. I was just, oh, thank you. Um, the first uh, vote that we have open is on um, tab seven, and it's on the Kalinga item. Excuse me, and it's on option one A. And how would you vote on that? Aye. Aye. Very good. That motion does carry. Wait, wait a minute. I'm sorry. I misspoke. It's 1B. 1B without the high, per high performance. I'm sorry. I misspoke. Aye. Aye. Okay. Now that motion does carry once the HPI grants are approved by OAL. I'm sorry? Okay. And then on. No, the first, the first one passed. Okay. The first one is 1A. Yeah. Yes, yes. The, 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 uh, and the other one right. carried. So we're, we're good. Yes. The 1A. She can add to the 1B carried and the and the HPI once approved by OAL. She just voted on and it carried. That was the third one. Mm -hmm. And I think that is clear, isn't that? Yes, correct? because okay. we the second the second set of votes was to split it and the first part of the split passed with the members present. That's the correct. second item has now passed with Senator Hancock. That's correct. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you. No?